Hi there. It's the last panel. Are you excited? All right. Hi, my name's Jim Thompson. I'm the Director for Partnerships and Global Engagement at the National Security Council at the White House. Um, this is really exciting. I'm, I'm thrilled to be back here uh, at the 11th Annual Conference. Um, I've attended a lot of these over the years. I can't say it was all 11, but it has been a, a, quite a number. Um, I always learned a tremendous amount. Um, and one of the things I learned was I, I am not the smartest person in this room by far. Um, and even as I started to put together questions for this panel, I thought, huh, I probably should ask my panelists what they would want to be asked because they're going to be smarter about all of this than me. So I asked all of them, I said, why don't you tell me what I should even ask you? Um, so I'm actually going to go ahead and even let them go ahead, quickly introduce themselves. Um, tell me a little bit about who you are and where you're coming from, and then we'll, then we'll get into some lessons learned about what we've learned over the last year or so um, as it relates to humanitarian crises that have become both international and domestic at the same time. But let me hear from all of you. Mike, I'm going to start with you. Thanks, uh, Jim. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, all of you obviously have been in this conference for, I think, a few days, uh, so appreciate your patience. I heard there is not lunch after this, so I'm not holding you to anything. Um, so if anything, just really eager to describe uh, the work that USAID is doing, specifically in managing and responding to the crisis in Ukraine. My name is Mark Simakovsky. I'm a Deputy Assistant Administrator for Europe and Eurasia at USAID. Uh, I am responsible for uh, managing and responding to the USAID response to the uh, humanitarian and development uh, and, of course, economic challenge uh, that's wrought by Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine. I've actually been on the job for a, a sum total of six months, uh, arrived coincidentally a month before uh, the invasion. I actually worked uh, Russia's invasion of uh, Georgia in 2008 at the Pentagon and Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2014, where I was the Russia director. So I have a few lessons learned that I've been able to draw from my experience. But, you know, overall, I think... This is an unprecedented humanitarian crisis, a disaster uh, that is sitting in the middle of Europe. Uh, USAID uh, has responded, I think, uh, along with the USG in an, an unprecedented fashion. There obviously is a humanitarian disaster, and so we have been channeling assistance to uh, Ukrainians that have been displaced, you know, 15 million people displaced inside the country, uh, 6 million uh, refugees outside of the country, um, as well as just incredible mass movements of people uh, in, frankly, an, an unprecedented fashion in the middle of Europe. Um, we have also marshaled, uh, in a way, resources uh, at the speed of which has never been seen, uh, and, and surely not since uh, to Europe since the Marshall Plan. Um, the U.S. government has provided $4.5 billion in direct budget support, uh, to Ukraine, potentially with another $4 billion coming in a matter of weeks, which my office is working on. Um, the U.S. aid has provided over a billion dollars in humanitarian assistance in Ukraine, again, in a fashion and a speed in which that even though the U.S. government uh, was working to prepare for this contingency, you know, we were spending weeks and months, frankly, preparing at the end of last year for this potential and unfortunate eventuality. Uh, to still move that level of assistance. You know, I was at a meeting yesterday where we were talking about another tranche of $220 million that was going to be signed uh, to move out the door this week. You know, the numbers are just um, so impressive, uh, so unfortunately impressive, but also we've gotten to a point where it's just a regular basis of moving tens and hundreds of millions of dollars to assistance to uh, some of our international um, partners. We also, in my office, at, uh, in the E&E &E Bureau, has focused on an incredible range of bolstering development assistance. And I want to reinforce that the developmental assistance that we are providing Ukraine uh, is there to help the country integrate. And so there is a humanitarian crisis. Uh, we are giving the Ukrainians the tools to win, uh, to defeat Russia, and to push back on this aggression. But we also are seeking to help them recover and rebuild the country, uh, not so it's going back to where the Ukraine was before the war, but to ensure and facilitate Ukraine's ability to leapfrog into Europe as an EU candidate member. So in many ways, the assistance and the support that USAID is providing uh, has a dual purpose, which is essentially to help Ukraine and the Ukrainian people meet their own aspirations 
uh, on integrating with the EU. So we're providing incredible amounts of support on uh, bolstering their education sector, their health sector, helping them with cyber capabilities, um, helping on democracy and governments, as well as really trying to ensure that the assistance that we're providing um, uh, isn't going for the wrong places. So building up and res their resiliency on anti-corruption as well. And then finally, the, for all of you, the private sector plays a huge role in this. Um, without the private sector and its own support and the bolstering of public and private partnerships, we can't help uh, ensure that Ukraine succeeds. And the private sector, I think, in particular, has played a really important role. We have an Assist Ukraine team. One of my colleagues, uh, Avinash, is here, who's been leading our Assist Ukraine team. We were just faced with a deluge of assistance uh, offers very early on in the crisis in February and March, uh, which we had a hard time managing. You know, Some was in-kind support. Some was, uh, uh, how do we get you know, pallets of equipment. So we set up a team in USA to channel those offers of assistance from the private sector uh, to lean in on the ones that we thought were most effective. But as we move into a stage potentially of recovery and reconstruction, knowing that this conflict uh, still uh, is flaring hot, uh, we have to figure out ways of facilitating and, and filling gaps of where the USG maybe is not as well positioned, particularly on areas like infrastructure. Um, we've had an incredible donation uh, from a partner for laptops. Um, you know, the school season is coming in Ukraine. Uh, the winter is coming in Ukraine. So winterization, uh, getting uh, people back into adequate housing. Um, so again, the challenge will just continue, I think, to overwhelm the uh, resources as we have. So I think we are really looking forward to working with the private sector and the capabilities the private sector has on figuring out how to help Ukraine uh, uh, not only survive, but succeed as it moves forward uh, in the coming months. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. I, I know we're gonna have a ton of questions on Ukraine specific, but I'm gonna jump quickly to David um, to talk to us a little bit about his work at Team Rubicon. But really, I wanna get into the question of, um, you know, we've had kind of crisis after crisis this past year, starting with COVID, you know, two years ago, um, then the Afghan resettlement, and then the issues in Ukraine. How has this affected Team Rubicon and sort of what you're doing with the private sector in particular? Yeah, thank you, Jim. Uh, I'm David Burke. I'm Team Rubicon's Chief Programs Officer, and Team Rubicon is a veteran-led humanitarian organization that responds to disasters and crises around the world. And the reality of the past three years has really changed the trajectory of the organization and needs in our communities uh, domestically and overseas. So. You know, Mark provided an incredible overview of what's been going on in Ukraine, and Team Rubicon played a role early uh, when the forecast called for a devastating rout of Russian forces across the entire country. Our medical teams were on the ground, but as that forecast faltered and then the Russians, you know, slowed and failed in that uh, initial attempt, our teams quickly transitioned into a training role trained uh, over 2,000 Ukrainian civilians and medical providers in skills that they needed to support the risks that their communities were facing, different skills than they'd uh, used previously or they trained to previously. And then uh, as we look to go back and support Ukraine further, we'll work in two areas that the Ukrainian medical system didn't support before this invasion, and that's portable ultrasound that can greatly increase the effectiveness of battlefield medicine and whole blood transfusion away from the clinical setting. So it's uh, referred to as blood far forward, which also greatly improves the, the care on the battlefield. But before any of this happened, uh, our withdrawal as a, as a country from Afghanistan created another crisis and 70,000 Afghans were trying to get reintegrated into the United States across 11 different military bases. And the overall government infrastructure didn't have a perfect solution for this problem set. And Team Rubicon stepped in and helped manage warehousing and materials and private sector donations of valued at around $35 million to just provide basic necessities, conservative clothing, household goods, the things that Afghan families needed as they transitioned off of these military bases and, and tried to uh, integrate into communities across our country. And these allies supported our efforts in that theater for decades and deserved everything we could provide as a, as a whole community. The private sector stood up, the government worked to find the seams in the authorities to make sure that they could do the best possible, and partners like Airbnb and many, many private sector partners helped make sure those transitions were as smooth as they could be. 
Uh, Team Rubicon's continued in setting up homes, so the last mile of those Afghan families getting to a permanent residence and, and having a place that is furnished and has basic kitchen necessities so they can continue on, on this transition. And COVID uh, disrupted the entire country. Every community was equally impacted, but every population was unequally impacted. Different populations across the country, different parts of communities had different levels of resourcing. And Team Rubicon flexed with public and private support to work in 110 different cities across the country to facilitate testing, facilitate vaccination uh, to, the, to the total of about 1.6 million vaccinations across the country that Team Rubicon supported the administration of. And it identified all kinds of different gaps in the system when there's a universal impact. We're very used to the resilience of our country and being able to operate across state lines and move resources from community to community. But when every community is equally impacted, uh, we saw the fractures and the, the risk of the lack of preparedness or resilience that we have in our systems because there wasn't the ability to call on our neighbors to help as much as there has been historically in large scale disasters. So these three different uh, crises have driven a, a very different perspective of what resilience means domestically and internationally. COVID didn't limit the U.S. And, and really the inequity of that disease has shown up in the rest of the world in humanitarian indicators decreasing that haven't decreased since World War II in parts of the world that still don't have sufficient vaccine to vaccinate even their high-risk populations don't have any treatment options, any of the medical interventions that are possible here. So the, the COVID pandemic continues to drive an impact on humanitarian need across the entire world. And we're stacked with additional challenges of Afghan resettlement and the Russian invasion in Ukraine. Thanks, David. And I, I gotta tell you, um, your work in at least the Afghan resettlement, if nothing else, um, really brought home the importance of these partnerships and, and groups working together with Airbnb and, and other NGOs and, and the for-profit sector. Um, we had 70,000 people, uh, refugees, show up on our shores in 11 refugee camps spread out across the country, and, and we didn't have a lot of authorities. It was kind of weird. Normally, we would rely upon FEMA authorities to you know, do what was necessary, but it wasn't a declared emergency, so we couldn't use FEMA's authorities. And, and we quickly realized it was the end of the fiscal year. There wasn't any money. Um, there obviously wasn't a planned uh, emergency and didn't have those authorities. So suddenly it was like, wow, the Afghans came with very little. And what little they did come with, the luggage that they had was separated from them at the airports. Um, so they were on base with nothing. Uh, and we had to get them clothing, formula, baby bottles, diapers, feminine napkins, and it, it, it relied completely upon the private sector uh, and completely upon our friends in the NGO community to, to help get that and distribute that. And the nine chartered resettlement agencies of the country, the, the other NGOs that do this work year in, year out, didn't have a warning for this. The, the 70,000 was an increase on their planned resettlement work. So these nine agencies are entirely overwhelmed and they responded very, very effectively and, and nobly, but there was no way to look at your plan for the year and in the last months with no additional funding, just double your ability, double your capacity and have it all come at once. So that was a, a incredible challenge for those organizations, but they've done incredible. It was, and, it, and it was kind of strange too, because they didn't have the access to the base um, and Team Rubicon having all military veterans all knew how military bases worked. And they were operating NGO on almost most of the bases that we had. I think, I think the American Red Cross had a couple, but I think you guys ran the, the lion's share uh, for the bases. So thank you for that work. It was a truly tremendous partnership. And Sadie, I'm, I'm going to come to you. I want to hear a little bit about Airbnb. And obviously, you guys, such a huge help, too, with the Afghan resettlement in Ukraine. Um, you come from Airbnb.org. So I'd love to hear a little bit about you know, how Airbnb and Airbnb.org work together. How does that, how does that work? Yeah, I, I love that question, and I love hearing the just the importance of the collaboration. I think it's something that we internally recognize as well. And so Airbnb.org is a separate entity from Airbnb.com. 
we're uniquely positioned where we are able to tap into the resources, to the funding, to the expertise, to the host community that's on the Airbnb.com uh, platform. Um, but our mission comes straight from our board and our, and our own executives. And so we have one goal, which is essentially to house people who have been displaced, whether by disaster or by forced resettlement, um, of whether somebody is relocating to another country on their own to seek asylum. Um, and so we are able to offer them free temporary housing um, that's picked up by our, our funders uh, and our, our donors. And, and so it's really a special place to be because we're able to amplify the impact we have by working with other organizations, whether it's another nonprofit, whether it's a government organization, or whether it's another private sector entity. And so we're always looking for ways to collaborate. To, and, and we've learned, um, particularly with Ukraine and Afghan, uh, the responses is that the key for us is to figure out what organizations can we align with so that what we can offer can be done in tandem with what they are offering so that it's not disruptive at the time. So it complements that aid. And so that what we're offering is something that's of value both to the organizations um, so they can dedicate some time and resources to help us reach the people that are in need. And so we really are, are in a position where we rely on what we call our, our allies um, to, to help get us that close connection to the people in need, make that affirmation so we know are we giving our aid to the people who actually need it? Um, and that we're making a difference and that it's value added for, for the entire community. And I'll tell you just the, it was the strangest offer. It was Airbnb came to us and said, we can offer up housing. Thousands, tens of thousands of units of housing. And, and it was like, normally that would not, I mean, maybe in a FEMA emergency, if there's a, if there's a hurricane blow through that, that is needed. But on a, on a nationwide basis, um, suddenly to have that, offer that that capacity available to us was just huge because that was the one thing that we absolutely needed um, having been down to the base uh, one of the bases where the afghans were we knew we had to get the afghans off the afghan uh, settlers off of these bases um, they were in tents that were the size of a football field um, one tent you know and row after row after row of families uh, sleeping in these tents and it was like this was not sustainable and it's fall uh, Winter was coming. Um, we we knew we had to we had to move quickly. So, having Airbnb and the resettlement agencies uh, working together uh, was a true true success um, in a in a very difficult situation. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, um, Jared. I want to come to you uh, and talk a little bit about what MIT uh, and your humanitarian lab does. Um, it's kind of fun to have this panel because it's it's. It's government, NGO, and academia coming together. So I'd love to hear a little bit about what you've found in this, and, and then maybe a little bit about cash versus non-cash, um, and sort of what you've seen, what works best. Yeah, well, thanks for the invitation, for bringing in academic on stage. We, uh, uh, our Center for Transportation and Logistics at MIT really focuses on applied research and practical research to uh, drive change and innovation in, in industry. Um, we have an education program, and I'm going to tell a little story up front about Ukraine. Um, we have a master's program at MIT in, in supply chain, as well as partner centers in um, uh, Spain, uh, Luxembourg, um, China, Colombia, um, and Malaysia, and an extensive network. And plus, we have some online learners. So there's a lot of people learning about supply chains. During the Ukraine crisis, you know, trying, trying to find a supply chain that can meet needs. We had one alum who's from Ukraine who had connections with a third-party logistics provider who could, who had a warehouse in, in the U.S., had uh, available contracts. They already had shipping uh, through into the country and throughout the country. Another alum had a, had a uh, connection to a health organization that was approved by the Ministry of Health in the Ukraine to be a direct service provider. And so the ability of, you know, we talk about partnerships, the ability of students and networks that they have to connect, you know, supply capability with a direct demand, you know, group that knows the health facilities and has been working with them already. It's not a new thing to connect supply and demand in real time uh, and help enable that flow is really exciting to see. So the power of students and networks that they have to help, you know, facilitate supply chains in crisis. Um, but our lab, you know, at MIT we do research uh, and we research on supply chains. And yes, we've been doing research on supply chains even though, 
most people may think that we're, they're going to blame us for the, for the issues of the past few years, but um, they're complex, they're, they're increasingly complex, and it's, they're especially complex in a crisis when you lose infrastructure, when there's conflict, and there's a lot of constraints that come into play. Um, and so while you know, I've done work, we just still do work with the private sector during regular times to increase the ability and effectiveness of a supply chain, our lab focuses on crisis situations, so humanitarian situations. And we've worked globally since our first study was actually the 2003 Indian Ocean tsunami, um, which was a big sea change in international humanitarian response, and I, um, uh, all the way through um, active work in the U.S. with FEMA and others to help enable the private sector in the U.S. to recover quickly. Um, and, and what the government can do to support that recovery, that business recovery, which is so essential to meeting people's needs. Um, and it's interesting because we work, you know, internationally with uh, the NGOs and the, what's called the cluster system, um, organized by the UN Office of Coordination and Humanitarian Affairs. And there's been a lot of formalization in the international community about how to engage the private sector. And it started with that tsunami in 2003. Um, when they realized a lot of times they couldn't bring goods in because of all the constraints. The tsunami wiped out so much capacity. But yet there were local providers, local market providers who could adapt and find ways to get food to people and so forth. And they said, well, we could give them cash. And they can buy from local markets, which are often, you know, those local markets are a lot more nimble and adaptable. And that proved effective. And then they said, well, how can we learn from this? And a group of uh, organizations, Mercy Corps, Oxfam, Save the Children, Red Cross, got together and created what they called the Cash Assistance Learning Partnership. And it was a partnership created in 2005. They started talking about how can we use cash more effectively going forward. Uh, it formalized in, in, in 2008 as an organization to, of, of a network of, comp, of organizations. There are some toolkits that came out in 2010 to learn how to better give people cash because it enables several things. One is it enables them to choose what they need rather, having, rather than having to guess what they need and send something to them. They get to choose what's most important for their, for their livelihoods and their family. Secondly, it helps that, that economy that's been uh, devastated recover because you're, you're feeding and you're stimulating demand, enabling them to get their businesses up and running again and serving those populations. And it's proven effective um, in, in many crises, uh, some more than others. Uh, in providing cash, um, but I think there's a lot to learn in this public-private partnership space from the, this extensive interaction over the years of, of non-government organizations, nonprofits, learning how to understand how the markets are working, um, you know, and in, often in very informal settings, and, and making sure that they can put cash in effectively. Because if you, if you add cash to a market that doesn't have supply, that you don't know if the supply chains are going to be able to respond, that drives the prices up. And the inflation then did, um, makes it such that the other community members aren't able to buy what they would normally buy. So you have to be very careful and delicate with putting cash in in the right places where you know that there will be a, a market to receive it. And I think there's a lot that can be learned in domestic response from what the international community has learned in, these, in, in many responses where they've used cash programming to facilitate the market response and the recovery. Yeah, you, you've honed in on one of the questions that I really have is this international versus domestic um, issues. I, I feel like this year in particular has been the year where international crises have huge domestic uh, implications. Um, everything from the Afghans resettling, uh, obviously COVID uh, with uh, it being a global pandemic and then having a huge impact here in the United States, um, straight through to Ukraine uh, where we now have, you know, we've um, put, uh, a number out for 100,000 Ukrainian refugees to come to the United States as well uh, into our, our very tenuous <laughs> refugee systems. Our refugee systems in the United States are managed by several different government agencies, um, but really rely completely upon the non-governmental organizations to make it work. Um, so it, and, and they're stressed. Um, so we, we have yet another international situation that is uh, causing domestic uh, issues. and. Even the fact of oil prices uh, and inflation, the fact that it's having sort of what's happening on the international side domestically. So I'm, I'm curious, for any of you or all of you, um, what do you see happening um, between the international and the national and, and sort of how, is, how, is, how are partnerships able to help us achieve uh, 
uh, equitable outcomes uh, for the beneficiaries in these types of programs? Are you seeing any, any change in the way that we've looked at international versus domestic? I mean, I, I can start, um, it gets back to you know, the start of the panel, which is lessons learned and how public-private partnerships can help alleviate human, humanitarian crises and global challenge. A few lessons learned that we've seen from USAID for Ukraine in particular is one, humanitarian crises don't just happen uh, in areas that are underdeveloped. So you have obviously a, uh, a war, a raging conventional conflict in the middle of Europe, in the largest country in Europe um, from a nuclear armed power. So the, the impact of that conflict on all Americans uh, I think is much more palpable because of the risk of escalation, particularly with the United States choosing to provide um, the scale of security assistance that uh, is unprecedented uh, to physically provide the Ukrainians the ability to um, uh, defend themselves. And as a result, the Russian Federation is taking incredible casualties, which is a huge risk of escalation. But as a result of it occurring in a modern uh, country like Ukraine, there are corporations and uh, uh, private sector engagement and people that are operating in Ukraine on a daily basis. So our ability tap into that, uh, I think, has been very effective uh, for USA to be able to uh, engage with and for the private sector to, to see what it can do um, inside the country. The other piece, I think, that has been missing in most international crises around the world for the United States is bipartisan consensus, something that is, uh, I think, uh, a word that doesn't exist very often in Washington. And the scale of the U.S. response was triggered primarily because of an incredible groundswell of bipartisan consensus to support Ukraine uh, to the tune of hundreds and millions of dollars in assistance, a $40 billion supplemental, again, a number I would have never imagined having dealt with this crisis. So when there is bipartisan consensus, there also is the confidence in the Congress that the American people are going to, to support an initiative and, and private sector and businesses take note of that as well and feel like it's their civic duty uh, as well to uh, to engage. Uh, the other, I think, is an example of what we're doing now is humanitarian crises uh, in a place, even if it's isolated, will impact everything that you do. So when I go with my three kids to the grocery store and buy them a loaf of bread, uh, the, the, the price of bread is doubled in some places, and that's because of a global food ins insecurity, uh, partly triggered by uh, a blockade of Ukraine's Black Sea ports. Ukraine, uh, again, has an incre incredible role to play in exporting grain around the world. Um, so for the last two months, my team and I have been developing an approach of, uh, and Administrator Power announced it uh, this month, that will facilitate the utility and the use of $100 million of USAID programs to help Ukraine alleviate its export crisis, which has been driven by the blockade of Ukraine's Black Sea ports. Now, there has been a deal agreed to last week. I just got an email that we're hoping potentially one of the ships could move at some point in the next few days. Um, but again, this Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, and this Russian isolation of Ukraine has hampered the ability of the Ukrainians to export. So the U.S. government now is engaged, uh, and the private sector is playing a role. We're meeting on a weekly basis with all the uh, major agricultural com companies in the world. We're engaging with our EU counterparts that are seeking to alleviate uh, some of the bottlenecks on Ukraine's uh, land and, and um, water routes westward that essentially run independently of the Black Sea ports. Again, very challenging to move centuries of agriculture that has been moving through the Black Sea uh, westward and southward uh, all over the world to do that overnight um, to Western land routes. But without the private sector and without the, the leadership and the assistance that, the, that governments can provide, um, we're not going to be able to alleviate Ukraine's export challenge. And again, I think it's a, a perfect example of how uh, the public and the private sector can work together uh, to try to not only help Ukraine, but help those that are suffering as a result of food insecurity uh, around the world. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm actually going to ask if, if you guys want to quickly respond, that'd be great, but I really would love to get into sort of what, what the private sector is doing in Ukraine now. Um, 
but, but yeah, we, I'm happy yeah. to jump in and, and yeah. tag on to that. So one of the things we do um, is that the you heard me mention that we are able to tap into the expertise of our Airbnb.com uh, team, and so we have policy folks that work. Uh, we're a global enterprise, and we have policy folks that are positioned across the globe. And so when we're thinking about the difference between domestically or responding um, in a global setting or internationally, we lie we rely on them to tell us to navigate how these different countries and their regulations and their policies work, what kind of aid is going to be available pe to people who are displaced, what is the time frame that we can fit in where our temporary stays are beneficial to people who are displaced, um, what do we have to be mindful of, what is our host community, how are they going to be impacted, what are the short-term rental regulations, and so they in turn have their own relationships with governments in these international locations. They have uh, relationships with other nonprofits, with universities, with gov um, with other private sector entities. And so we rely on them to give us that feedback so that when we're thinking about how we're going to position ourselves operationally, we're doing so in a way that makes sense for each of these countries. And I think um, for us, that's what allowed us to essentially think about what do the folks who are fleeing need and how can we position them so that they have the agency to say where they want to go? And so we don't focus on where we think they want to go. We focus on if we see that they're going to these locations and this is how we need to operate in, in Italy. This is how we have to operate in Poland. This is how we have to operate in Germany. We make sure that we rely on that expertise so that we're setting it up so we can offer our aid consistent with those other regulations and support the pathway for them to get the aid that exists in those other locations. That's great. Anything on, I'm curious, because you're, you're from Airbnb and, and Ukraine is not, um, not a developing country by any stretch of the imagination. Their use of technology is on par with the rest of Europe. I'm wondering, you know, have, have we seen technolo technology play a role in that and in, in enabling them to go where they want to go? Yeah, it's, all, it's always a, a concern, right? Um, we are a tech company. We rely on a tech platform. We need uh, access to things like the internet, to uh, smartphones, to uh, laptops. And so part of that is thinking about are the people tech savvy that we're going to be supporting? And when we're thinking about our diversity, equity, and inclusion um, priorities, we want to engage with organizations who are working with people or positioned to provide that one-to-one -one support. So a lot of times, you know, we can certainly uh, engage with organizations who are churning out, um, they have a really, really uh, highly organized system and are helping thousands of people. We can work with them. We can also work with people who are set up to actually spend one-to-one -one time on smaller populations. And so we're flexible enough that we can offer that support and leverage those relationships with those other organizations. All of our aid goes straight to the person. We rely on our partners to help us get it to them. Sometimes it looks like just getting an email. Sometimes it looks like, hey, let me help you set up this account. This is how you, this is how you upload your, your ID or things like that. And so that's why they're so important to us. You know, we're a small team. But what we can do, the impact when we part with other organizations is expounded enormously. Jared, are you seeing a, a real difference in this situation versus others? Um. I mean, it, it's it's different in many ways. Is a, a a lot of the international actors um, are, are used to working with governments that may not have the same capabilities as the Ukrainian government. Mm -hmm. So the the Ukrainian government can play a little bit different role than than in a you know, a lot of other responses that we've seen. Um, but I, I kind of want to come back to the question about the international and domestic because, like Mark was just mentioning, that we're th having to think about a land route for moving grain. Like that's a big shift in planning. But big shifts in planning would be needed in the, in the U.S. for a domestic disaster. In fact, we've been doing work with uh, FEMA. We did work with FEMA around the, um, the exercise this year around Cascadia earthquake. You're going to lose the seaports. You're going to have to have a massive land route to bring food and, food and supplies into the Seattle area. Um, and it was highlighted before the importance of planning together with the private sector. That planning together about what would you do if you have to do something you have never thought of before. And, uh, and a lot of companies may not have thought of this either. So I think a little bit of that preparedness work ahead of time, learning from what the experiences we have internationally to think about scenarios where we might need to be thinking more directly about engaging the private sector in that planning and in that contingency work. Um, the other thing I'd mention is a lot of work, a lot of discussion about small businesses. 
um, and internationally, and I'm, and I'm guessing in the Ukraine as well, a lot of the, the, the cash aid is going to be supported by small businesses. It's hard to understand fully how, how, they, how they work, and, but, but work ahead. And, and you mentioned before, Mark, about the link between economic development and a crisis response. A lot of work we, we do in the U.S. around develop, economic development can be leveraged by understanding how businesses work um, in order to see how they can be a unique role in supporting communities, which a lot of times in the small businesses serve the, the more vulnerable communities. So there's a lot of parallels there, too, internationally, domestically, about how we can work in, in lower scale, more fragmented private sector settings to better serve the most vulnerable people. David, I, I, I want to come back to you on this question because, I mean, this really gets to the, the heart of resilience. Um, and, you know, we established like a new baseline for resilience and, and what do partnerships have to play in that role? And yeah, it's a, it's a, a great kind of segue from Jared's comments around Cascadia and, and what, what are we really planning for? How do we define a baseline that we can be resilient to if you look at the happenings of the last three years? The last three years have reset everyone's expectation of what we need to be prepared to endure and how we can show resilience through it. And I think the, the connection from you know, the grain trying to get out of Ukraine to grain prices in Africa where many cash programming uh, pilots are still ongoing. There's minimum uh, basic income, universal basic income pilots all over the African continent in different locations, and now the grain prices are skyrocketing because it's not available from Ukraine, and it's going to corrupt the research there and how effective cash can be. And so these, th this new baseline that we have to think about operating in, a, a persistent potential war in, on the European continent, is a, a different planning factor. And if we're, as uh, the opening panel said, always planning for the last disaster, we're never gonna make progress towards the, the new state that we're living in. And one more interesting point on cash that I think is, is really important that Jared didn't extend all the way into was this, this idea that you can leverage the local markets as effectively as possible. That also opens up the infrastructure for things that local markets can't provide. So then our private sector partners can move goods that are truly needed and truly valuable for those crises and the infrastructure is not so clogged that you can't move anything. When in 2010, Team Rubicon's founding response, there were winter coats showing up in Haiti. It's not a very useful item. So if cash can do as much of the lifting as possible, then the infrastructure remains open to support the more accurate needs that come out of those initial, initial assessments. And I'd like to highlight too, in the US, we have a lot of the challenges internationally with cash is how to ensure the security of the transfer of the cash, the identity of the people, the data, all the, there's a lot of issues in getting cash to people and there's a lot of good work on that. Um, in the US, we've done a lot of that work with SNAP. We can turn on emergency SNAP. And so the, the ability to use SNAP more effectively and understand how that's, how that's being used by the local markets and so forth, there's a lot of potential to learn from when we've been able to activate cash to support the vulnerable in emergencies in the US. We only have a, a couple minutes left here on the panel, but I really wanted to come to one last thing on Ukraine, which is what more can we do? What more can the private sector do um, in Ukraine specifically? I think, I'm Mark, I don't know where you're sitting, maybe back there, but I, I keep track, there you are. We do at the White House watch your tracker on Ukraine. Um, I do report the numbers up to the suite on you know how much the private sector has donated uh, to different disasters. and. The, over a billion dollars now of private sector donations uh, have gone to Ukraine, in and around Ukraine, for uh, humanitarian assistance. Um, there will be a rebuilding phase, um, you know, at some point, hopefully soon. Um, and I'm curious what our panel thinks about what more can we do in Ukraine? What more can the private sector do in Ukraine? I'll, I'll start um, knowing maybe we'll save a minute for everyone on this. Um, so one, you know, unfortunately the needs are unlimited in Ukraine and, and I'm seeing the kinds of assistance that none of us would have imagined. Um, and most importantly, I think we have to be responsive to Ukrainian needs and what Ukrainians are requesting. There was a Lugano conference a few weeks ago around July 4th that our assistant administrator participated in where the Ukrainians have rolled out their 
initial plans for recovery and reconstruction. And those are broken out into a whole range of sub, sub areas, geographic areas. But uh, I think clearly being responsive to Ukrainian needs in terms of education, one. You know, I think that there are limits in terms of what the USAID has been able to provide in terms of resources for helping Ukrainian uh, kids get back to school. Um, so laptops, uh, materials, remote learning, infrastructure, uh, again, in-kind contributions uh, in cash to organizations that are facilitating education is one. I think winterization um, in terms of where things are going with uh, the Ukrainian population being vulnerable uh, and, and without shelter. Um, another, I think, is healthcare. Uh, clearly, is a huge need. Something that Team Rubicon has been doing in terms of supporting uh, the medical system, uh, and and I also think that uh, there is a whole range of assistance to provide to build resiliency in communities, particularly communities that have been uprooted. Obviously, infrastructure is another area uh, of being able to again provide the Ukrainian government the kind of assistance and technical support. Uh, to physically rebuild the hard infrastructure. I think the U.S. government has had mixed success in the past on supporting infrastructure, and it's something that we don't have the resources yet to commit to. But most importantly, I think, again, engaging with the public sector, uh, with the U.S. government, on areas where the private sector can provide assistance. And because of our implementing partners and our experience in the ground and our connections that we have at USAID uh, with the Ukrainians, we can put people in touch to get resources to the best use very quickly. Great. Other, other th I'll, thoughts quickly? I'll jump in quickly. We, in the one universal truth, domestic and international, is disasters and crises start and end locally. Local populations are impacted first, and they're impacted for the longest, and they have the longest route to recovery. So you know, to, to jump on Mark's point, trust, trust the Ukrainian government, trust the Ukrainian uh, organizations that know what the needs are and identify a trusted partner to work implementation with or provide unrestricted funding to, to give flexibility. If we've seen anything in this crisis, it's been constant change. Every forecast, every estimate from every government that's been functioning with the Ukrainian government has been less than perfectly accurate. So if funding is overly restricted, the organizations you're trying to support don't have the opportunity to flex to a changing environment. And I think we'll continue to see a changing environment in Ukraine. Yeah, I love the unrestricted funding. That's <laughs> really important. The other thing is to be really clear about what you can offer. So know what it is, what it, whatever your organization's superpower or the, the resource that you have or can tap into, and be able to offer that clearly and, and let people know how they can get to it. This is what I can give you. This is what we've got to offer. This is how you get it. I guess I'd say I think a lot of times companies may not see a role in the reconstruction or restoration and recovery of a, of, of, in a foreign country, especially if they don't have a strong presence themselves. But um, the capabilities of the Ukrainian government and the, the needs that people have understood may provide an opportunity to learn differently on how, how they can be more engaged internationally uh, and work with governments to, to better restore, uh, restore capabilities that are improved versus what they were before. Well, Mark, David, Sadie, and Jared, thank you very much uh, for participating in this conversation. Uh, truly interesting, really well um, laid out for us. Um, I think it was, a, it was great to get the questions from you uh, as opposed to make them up myself. Um, I'd like to thank Rob Glenn uh, and the U.S. Chamber and Mark DeCourcy uh, for having us here today. Um, and a big round of thanks to our panelists uh, for engaging in this conversation. Thank you, guys. Thank you.